So friends, students and colleagues, good afternoon and good morning from wherever you're coming from. My name is Jackie Paleo and I am one of the two VP externals at the UBC International Relations Student Association. Welcome to the third and final event of our three-part climate event series labeled Negotiating at the Brink, How Does the World Solve the Climate Crisis? co-organized by the Kumwakai Chair in Japanese Research and the UBC International Relations Student Association. This event will cover the normative considerations of the future of climate justice, listening to the perspectives of young activists and students, as well as indigenous speakers who are involved in the climate movement. To shed light on this topic, we are truly thrilled and honored to have a great lineup of panelists for today. Before going further, I would like to, to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Wachus peoples, as well as the Tswainik people who have called this area home for thousands of years and continue to do so today. Since we're on a virtual platform, I'd like to invite you to reflect upon the indigenous lands that you are on today as well. A good online resource to do so is called Native Land. I will send the link in the chat. Now, I would like to pass things on to Professor Eves, who will give us a brief introduction to the Kunwakai Chair. Professor Eves, go ahead. Thank you, Jackie. And hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure meeting you. So my name is Eve Tibergin, a Professor of Political Science, Kunwakai Chair in Japanese Research, and Director of the Center for Japanese Research at UBC, uh, located in the Institute of Asian Research and the SPPGA. This year, the Kai Chair is focusing its research, student engagement, and policy effort on questions of disruptions in the global order, with a special attention to Japan's and Canada's role in those global developments in the comparative framework. And we particularly focus this year on climate change, digital and AI governance, peace and conflict management, and Indo-Pacific strategies. So now I'm turning over the microphone uh, to our very special guest from the UBC Climate Hub, Megan Weiss, who will be our moderator for the remainder of the event. Over to you, Megan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you and greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining us today for this conversation on a critical topic of where uh, climate movement and momentum is headed and issues of climate justice. Uh, my name is Megan Weiss, I use she, her pronouns, and um, I'm the coordinator at the Climate Hub at UBC. Uh, the Climate Hub is a student-created, student-led organization that runs student-created programming around issues and intersections of climate justice. For example, we run the Youth Climate Ambassadors pro uh, Program that seeks to empower youth to become bold climate leaders through the power of storytelling. And we run the Climate Justice Research Collaborative that creates opportunities for students to engage climate justice-focused research for degree credit. Uh, our mission is to take bold climate action um, for climate justice by connecting communities, by building capacity for climate action at UBC and beyond. I would like to give a special thanks to the organizers of this event, uh, Christina Song and Soma Aoki uh, from the CJR Konwakai research team, as well as the IRSA team, in particular to Jackie Paleo, uh, Zora uh, Kalili, and Patricia Gonzalez. Uh, also thanks to CJR assistants, uh, Shiori uh, Uchida, um, I hope I'm saying uh, uh, that name correctly, as well as uh, Kanwakai Chairs RAs uh, Panthea uh, Parmalak and Hari Narayan. We also thank uh, Michelle Chung and Lizzie Marsh at the IAR and SPPGA uh, for their support. On a third event this evening, Future Paradigm for Climate Change Movement, uh, we will have our panelists address what climate justice means and what actions need to be taken to create a just future for our planet, specifically from the perspective of uh, the youth and voices that are not highlighted in international climate discussions. This includes questions such as what must be done to create a better and more just future for our communities and planet? What is the most important thing we can do in, in, uh, in the immediate future? And where do we take the environmental movement moving forward and how can we maximize its impact? I would also like to just go over a few uh, logistical announcements before we uh, dig into our panelist conversation today. Uh, the, chat uh, the chat function has been disabled. Questions can be asked on the Q&A window. 
Uh, please note that this webinar and following question and answer session will be recorded and will be made available on UBC, um, the S SSPGA and CJR websites. Um, if you're not required to use your camera, or so you're not required to use your camera or microphone to participate in the Q&A session, so you can write questions uh, to be submitted. Uh, everyone will see that in the Q&A session, and then you, the audience, can also upvote questions that you would like us to explore as well. Uh, and when we call in questions, we'll just use the first name as well, so there's a little bit of anonymity there as well for um, the recording dynamic as well. So today we are joined by a group of brilliant young climate activists around, from around the world who will share their insights on youth climate activism, obstacles, as well as opportunities they have to challenge the status quo of climate change policy. I would like to take a few moments to introduce, um, you know, we'll move through an introduction of each panelist um, and they'll have a, a few minutes to kind of explore the different issues and intersections that they'd like to engage with today. Um, so the first uh, speaker that we have today Dittmer Kramer, who is a Policy and Communications Officer at Protection Approaches UK. His research focuses on the intersections of climate change, human rights, and peace building, uh, being involved in community organizing, activism, and social justice, specifically with Indigenous rights, cultural rights, rights of minorities, refugees, and otherwise displaced persons. Uh, so Dittmer, I'd hand it over to you for about eight to ten minutes of your insights and reflections. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Hello, everyone. Yes, as you said, um, it was a wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Detmer. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I work for Protection Approaches. We are a UK-based charity uh, working on the prevention of identity-based violence, wherever it may occur. In my previous background, I've worked on uh, UN mechanisms in, uh, related to human rights and climate change, particularly um, based in Geneva, so the Human Rights Council. And before that, I did a lot of work in supporting Indigenous rights, uh, particularly regarding the Dakota Access Pipeline protests, which I'm also happy to talk about if there's any questions around those, those kind of things. Um, so yeah, thank you, first of all, so much for, for being here, uh, for gathering in this space, and for having invited me to speak alongside these incredible uh, people. It's really such an honor and privilege uh, to be here. Um, so when I saw the title for this event, thinking about the future paradigm of the climate movement, uh, coming from a prevention perspective, there's actually two dynamics of violence that, that immediately come out to me and that I wanted to talk about today. So the first is asking, how are we prepared for a world that we know is already here um, and is likely to worsen as we see that our significant consequences of climate change already locked in and unfolding as we speak? The second question is, are we prepared for the profound and seismic shifts required of our societies to prevent further climate collapse, but also to build a more just world. So before getting into how protection approaches, and I myself personally, think about how we can respond to this, I wanna tease out those connections just a little bit more. So that first connection, the connection between climate change itself and mass violence, um, shocks and climate disasters can really erode the resilience and stability of communities. At Protection Approaches, we know that it is this resilience that communities hold and the co cohesion that they have that makes communities resistant to the forces that seek to weaponize identities for power, profit, or flawed senses of security. Often a weaponization of identities uh, depends on using underlying grievances and pre-existing inequalities. Um, this then can be exacerbated by climate change. There's some really clear, I think, examples that illustrate that. If you look, for example, at resource scarcity, uh, when there's limited access to water, land, even air, food, all of these, these basic commodities that can, can increase tensions. It's also tensions, for example, around displacement where different communities uh, are forced to move, but also, and I think this is very important, communities that are not able to move, that are locked in a place and cannot afford, or, or as I said, are unable to move. These all are environments where people's identities can become weaponized uh, for violence. And I say can, because one, it is, it is not inevitable. And if it does happen, it is also still preventable. It's crucially why I work at a prevention organization, of course. Um, so this, these, there, there are specific consequences of climate change that are already locked in. And with that, we see that those contributing leads are hit hardest and contributing least to, to climate change uh, and emissions there. 
we see this ranging from, from rapid climate impacts, for example, in the Arctic and, and, and indigenous communities in, in Canada, um, but also desertification in the Sahel. But we also see it in the experiences of marginalized communities in other settings, thinking about homeless, elder, and disabled communities in cities and the impacts of heat islands, or the experiences of LGBTQI plus communities being scapegoated and blamed for natural disasters, while often not receiving the care needed in humanitarian responses, often being overlooked in those responses, as we've seen, for example, uh, during Hurricane Katrina in, in Louisiana in 2008. So that's the first connection. There's a clear connection between climate change and violence, but there's also a second connection I wanna talk about, which is how a response to climate change can also fuel violence. When we think about responding to climate change and how it can exacerbate dynamics of violence, I think the first place to talk about is climate mitigation. So we think, for example, about building dams for green energy or establishing national parks to protect biodiversity and carbon sinks we often still see approaches that displace uh, indigenous communities. But also when we think about the mining of required materials such as lithium or cobalt, we see again, there's a lack of thinking about how that increased mining might impact violence. Protection approaches um, together with um, a, a consortium of organizations, including uh, partners based in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we're seeing particularly that at mining, uh, uh, funds armed groups that further exacerbate situations of violence there. We also see inaccessible methods of adaptation, for example, subsidies for electric cars rather than investments in public transportation, again, entrenching inequality in our communities. So these risks also exist when we consider loss and damage, because this is, of course, post COP26 related series. Loss and damage has gained so much attention since COP26, and, and, and rightfully so. But we do need to think about, when we think about loss and damage, what that means for dynamics of violence. When you, for example, permanently relocate a community elsewhere, how do you make sure that that, that host community and that arrival community uh, strengthen one another rather than clash? Um, so there's a real, this real post COP26 urgency, even though we all know um, that ambition is still lacking, emissions are still rising, there is that increased momentum for climate action, um, for example, with, with movements like 30 by, uh, 30 by 30, which is uh, the, the, the pledge to protect 30% of the world's surface uh, by 2030. But without thinking about how that impacts violence, these, these pledges and commitments can exacerbate the risks I mentioned earlier, thinking about fortress conservation that displaces indigenous communities, all the way to thinking about countries uh, who are dependent on revenue from fossil fuels and thinking about what happens to a country like Saudi Arabia or Angola when all that revenue suddenly disappears overnight. So those, that's the kind of second dynamic of violence that I think is really important to think about how climate action can also lead to violence. Now, what can we do? Because I've painted a kind of bleak image. I'm very aware of that. And I do not want to just leave you with a very bleak image. Um, so what can we do? Um, first, I think it's very important that we think about horizontal change. There is no singular silver bullet or singular community that can shoulder all of this. Uh, we must be also, I think, very wary of overburdening or fetishizing local communities, especially when those communities aren't the ones responsible for this global crisis to begin with. So our responsibility um, to our fellow people and to the planet must be shared. And with a disproportionate, of course, uh, sharing of that burden by those of histories of polluting the most. Secondly, this responsibility that we all have means that from the United Nations to the individuals in, in the street must put that prevention front and center. At protection approaches, we focus uh, particularly on, on how, we can make, how we can change governments and their approach to it. And, and we hope to do that through both domestic and foreign policy. So we, we, we touch on both of those parts um, in the United Kingdom and in some of the other places where we work. We think this is very important because we know that violence can occur in every single society uh, and thus must also be prevented in all of all societies. There's no um, exceptional state where it doesn't happen. In our most recent paper, uh, Being the Difference, and I will put a link in the chat, um, 
which is our most recent publication, is actually a primer for states to think about how through inclusive and intersectional strategies of violence prevention, states can become better at understanding what those risks are, which are often very hard to see and understand because uh, there's so many factors and, and, and dynamics that are, that are a part of those. Um, communicating then those risks across departments, identifying the opportunities for intervention and responding swiftly. We see the need for this strategy as too often as a crisis emerges, there seems to be a really ad hoc response. It seems to be often quite slow, delayed, or piecemeal. Um, as risks rise, especially with these climate emergencies, without a strategy that thinks about risks of violence in this holistic and inclusive way, responses will remain slow and inadequate, but they will also fail to see these risks um, and miss opportunities to intervene. And the most vulnerable communities will yet again slip through those cracks. So in closing, my main worry um, about the future of the climate movement is that so much of the future that we warned about is already here in a lot of ways. And that's why a lot of the conversation, while climate mitigation adaptation remains crucial and important, it, a growing part of the conversation must now also reconcile with what do we do now? How do we live in the world that we have now created for us? And this is why I think the conversation around loss and damage received so much attention in Glasgow and why I join also so many to demand that justice, as well as the prevention of violence, are put at the center of climate action. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing um, what everyone else has to say. And I'm also really looking forward to uh, the question and try answers. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for those really rich insights on that um, and thinking about, you know, the lack of policy or poorly created policy as a form of violence, climate violence in itself. Um, and this idea of, of the frameworks we need to mobilize um, when thinking about climate policy to, to mitigate those harms. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and so now I want to move um, I'm, to our next speaker. Uh, Eden uh, Limeth uh, is a political science graduate student at the University of British Columbia, focusing on environmental impacts and governance mechanisms of the international um, marine shipping industry through the lens of neoliberalism and neocolonialism, a global climate government and, and or sorry, in global climate governance. Uh, she is also a member of the COP26 youth delegation. Uh, so Eden, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Megan, for that introduction and Detmer for your, your comments. Um, yeah, lots to think about there. Um, yeah, my name is Eden. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a graduate student at UBC and my focus generally is global climate governance, although I'm very interested in fossil fuel infrastructure and economy in Canada in particular. So welcome a lot of questions about that. Um, yeah, it is a deep injustice that the effects of climate change disproportionately harm already and will continue to harm the world's most vulnerable peoples and regions who ironically have contributed historically the least to this crisis. But when we talk about climate justice, it is not just an issue of, of climate change as an isolated incident, um, as there's a tendency to discuss climate change as the problem and we need to solve climate change. Um, when in reality, we need to recognize that climate change and the inequalities, it will continue to exacerbate. Um, you know, it is rather a symptom and a feedback loop to other issues, issues such as racism, class inequality and greed, the expansion of global capitalism, colonialism and other forms of oppression, as well as market supremacy um, at the expense of equity and justice. And this bigger issue of our very ruptured and extractive oriented relationships with the earth. So climate change is not so much the issue as a symptom of these bigger structural injustices um, that it is in fact exacerbating but not causing per se. However, you know, to provide some hope in this very bleak context, um, perhaps addressing such an issue like climate change is actually a huge and unprecedented opportunity and global challenge where we actually get to radically restructure and dismantle, dismantle these systems uh, because we have to, because human existence really does depend on it. So while the situation is dire, and I truly do mean dire, you can check out the latest um, IPCC report that came out a few weeks ago um, for that information. 
we must also see it as an opportunity um, to decolonize, to listen to marginalized groups and to challenge uh, Western development worldviews and recenter other alternative indigenous worldviews and values. Um, so in my talk today, I'll talk a little bit first about um, this fissure that I see in the environmental movement between kind of the corporate elite uh, type of environmentalism and people's environmentalism. Um, then I will go on to talk a little more about the neoliberalization of the climate change movement. Um, and I'll end with just some comments on what Canada can do in particular. Um, so yeah, the environmental movement um, is a really interesting movement because it's gained a lot of traction in the last couple decades and has become very mainstream. It is no longer fringe. You no longer have fossil fuel companies spreading misinformation like they did in the 70s. Now they've you know, turned and embraced climate change as an opportunity to clean up their supply chains and, and whatnot. So right now I see the environmental movement, um, which is often portrayed as one you know, global movement, actually as at least two or maybe several different movements that are not at all on the same page. Um, and this fissure was particularly um, apparent at COP26 um, in Glasgow in November. And I'll give you a really um, interesting example to illustrate that. So uh, at COP, I was uh, standing in the main hallway, um, lots of people going by, and suddenly these men in suits start pushing me out of the way. And um, I look over and these, these men in suits are surrounding Leonardo DiCaprio and Jeff Bezos with all of his forehead veins bulging, striding down the hall, um, after coming out of a press conference where they committed something like $2 billion to his uh, very humbly named Bezo Bezos Earth Fund for conservation, uh, which allegedly he was inspired to do after looking down on Earth from his pleasure trip to outer space last year. Um, and then immediately after this very jarring situation, I walk outside, I'm um, outside the gates of, gates of the conference, outside security, and I see several Coast Salish women and activists um, from the lands that I live on um, drumming and singing the women's song and talking about the missing and murdered women from their communities and the direct link between the loss of their lives and the extractive industry activities going on in British Columbia. So the environmental movement for these people, I think it is safe to say is not the same. And um, this, was, this separation was really clear um, at, at COP26 um, as well, there was a separate summit going on parallel to COP called the People's Summit, um, which was open to anyone. You didn't need to have a badge to enter and served as a much more radical and hopeful space for discussing alternatives to current systems and power dynamics. So there are at least two of these movements uh, that I see, and there are people who want to profit off or who have profited off the causes of the climate crisis and now they want to make sure that they can still profit off of the solutions to it. Um, so when we talk about addressing climate change and you know, making climate change profitable, um, we need to also ask who will it be profitable for? For the same billion dollar energy companies and CEOs? And how is that going to address the fundamental inequalities that have existed before climate change was a household term? Um, these inequalities that continue to grow day by day. Um, but I would like to mention there is immense power growing and mobilizations happening in the second movement, the people's movement. Uh, we've seen in the youth movement has been incredible at speaking truth to power and advocating for their future. And um, the mobilizations of indigenous peoples around the world uniting not only to call out the responsibility and violence of extractive industries and of global capitalism and colonialism, but also to provide beautiful and hopeful alternative worldviews, societal structures and relationships with the earth that we can hopefully learn from. Um, so I think when talking, taking this movement forward, we need to make sure we are centering the right movement. And we are focusing on the right people, the people who are advocating um, justice over profit, not profit over justice. And right now, unfortunately, the Bezos of the world have more financial resources, more media control, literally, and um, tons of political lobbying power, and also the power of the status quo. Um, and the more, the more corporate green movement really has gained a lot of the focus of the, the climate change movement. So to maximize the impact of this real movement, um, we really need to uplift the voices of workers, migrants, indigenous people, women, and global South activists the people who are really on the front lines of climate change um, and the people who didn't literally have to go to space to feel emotions or care about the earth and its inhabitants. 
Um, now I'll just talk a little more about what I mean when I say the neoliberalization of the efforts to address climate change. In my experience, um, when I worked at the United Nations Environment Program, but also at COP, and in particular in my research, um, reading through every state's nationally determined contributions, which are their targets um, that they set, that they say they're gonna reduce their emissions by a certain amount. Um, there is a lot of a great belief and trust that markets will solve the current crisis that, you know, as soon as renewables become cost effective, we'll solve the crisis, which they already are. So technically, we should have solved it by now. Um, people believe we can really innovate our way out of the crisis, which is also ironic, given that the fossil fuel subsidies remain in the trillions annually globally, billions domestically and provincially. So, you know, governments are actively counteracting these markets, these free markets that they claim um, will solve the crisis for us. I mean, this is also very evident in the way that the Paris Agreement is set up and um, specifically Article 6, which creates different market mechanisms for addressing climate change. And at COP this year, there's also this new trend um, of states and companies setting, you've probably heard, net zero targets, which sound really great because they have the word zero in there. It sounds like, you know, zero emissions. Um, but what it often does mean is paying someone else to reduce their emissions for you or paying to protect a, a forest or sequester carbon in some way. Um, and this often has very negative effects for people living in the global south, especially rural and indigenous communities. Um, in some cases, it means that indigenous groups and local and rural groups are um, removed from their lands to make their lands a conservation area um, to conserve that to offset uh, carbon. Um, and this is a, is a big issue um, with Article 6. But additionally, Article 6 creates a sustainable development mechanism which allows private companies to invest in uh, an emission reduction project in another country. Um, and then the uh, gains, the emission um, reductions from that project go to support the, the country that's investing. And often these, um, the investing countries are wealthy global north states and the host countries where the project is being run and invested in are developing nations. So this um, is an opportunity, but also a danger in how it uh, centers markets and potentially um, entrenches economic dependence on Western investment, facilitates external control over economic development trajectories of developing nations, um, and compels people to adhere to um, Western development trajectories and theories. So there are also uh, many issues with the way that markets are being centered um, in the solutions to climate change. So I'll move on um, to discuss what can Canada do um, given this crisis and given our role as one of the uh, largest polluters per capita and a huge fossil fuel exporter. Um, so the first thing I would say is wealthy developed nations like Canada need to pay their fair share. Um, you may have heard of this um, $100 billion number floating around um, back at the uh, Copenhagen meetings um, a decade ago over a decade ago, um, states, um, wealthy developing states promised to raise $100 billion annually for developing states to um, address climate change and deal with the effects that they're already feeling. And um, not once over the last decade has that number been met. Um, so we are still in a huge deficit in terms of seeing the actual, the, the finance and the money coming from wealthy nations that have profited off of this crisis, um, uh, reaching developing nations. So Canada definitely needs to, to show up there. Um, a second point, Canada needs to break up with fossil fuels and particularly needs to stop subsidizing them and uh, invest that money in a just transition now. Uh, recent estimates um, are that Canada spends between three and five billion dollars annually in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. And that doesn't even include all of the provincial subsidies um, that we see. BC subsidized the fossil fuel industry last year by $1.3 billion. So there's so much money. And imagine if we could invest these funds in communities on the front lines of climate change. Um, so that's a, you know, a key thing. We, we need to reinvest in a just transition, move away from fossil fuels. And I also, you know, I also do think about those working in the oil and gas industry and in the coal industry and in rural communities um, that do rely on extractive industries. Um, and I want to be clear that these communities and workers matter too, um, because often they are left out of the conversation and um, when they are excluded, there's a tendency for us to polarize this fight rather than unify the working class, which is what uh, we should be focusing on in Canada. And because our oil isn't even profitable now, it definitely won't be in, in five, 10 years. Um, and we need to, to reinvest and adjust transition as fast as possible. 
And then a final point of what Canada can do is we need to welcome alternatives to increasing growth and productivity, and we need to respect the sovereignty and self-determination of Indigenous peoples on these lands and really center and learn from Indigenous worldviews um, and center decolonization um, in our movement towards a, a juster future. Um, thank you very much. I hope I wasn't too long-winded or rambling, but yeah, there's just so much to, to say about this topic and I look forward to the Q&A and discussing further. No, that was wonderful. It's, it's very hard to distill such complex things into eight to 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, we can explore that more. And, and I appreciate you know, reflections on the, what could we do with redirecting $1.3 billion, for example, um, and what would that look like to put towards just transition and the importance of bringing everybody along to avoid those polarizations that, um, that we know that climate uh, issues can maybe foster. So really appreciate that reflection. Uh, so next up we have Annika uh, Kurbayashi, a high school activist in Japan who has, been leading, who has been a leading voice in Japan as a youth climate activist, uh, being involved in several key climate conferences, including the World Climate Summit in 2021. Annika, welcome, and I'll hand it over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, I am Anika Kurbayashi. I'm a 15 year old living in Japan and I became interested in the issue of climate change after enrolling in the school I attend now. One time in our class we watched a clip of Greta Thunberg talking at the UN climate change COP24 conference. She was no different from me, a girl who wanted to make a change in this world. And from the second I watched the video in class, I went home and researched everything I could about the reality and the ugliness of global warming. So in Japan, teachers downplay the threat of our changing climate. I wanted to know more about the topics they don't teach us in school. I have also spent five years living in the United States with my family when I was between the age of six to 11 and I have been interested in climate change since then. And so Japan is an island and there once existed a period of Edo era. And in the Edo era, Japan had locked up every passageway to the world and had excluded itself from globalization. Nothing new or not Japanese entered Japan and it was also called Sakoku, which means chained country. Even though this era has long been gone, it often feels like it still exists since not much information outside of Japan comes in. Japan is ahead of most countries in the advancement of technology, yes. But when it comes to information about climate change or anything that is not directly related to Japanese specific problems, it is unclear. A lot of the international news we receive here is vague and translucent. And so our school held a climate march where the whole school walked from the city station back to our school. We protested that our future is being stolen. However, little did we know when we went back to our school, there were negative comments posted on Twitter saying that it was disturbing and impolite. At this point, I believe it is not due to a lack of interest, but rather a lack of awareness. This issue is not placed high on the agenda of Japan's older generation, many of whom happen to be politicians who run the country. In Japan, the use of plastic outweighs the rest of the problems. So everywhere I go, plastic is used. Disposable plastic bags, plastic wrappings, packages, straws, and spoons. This country seems to be overflowing with plastic. In stores, if you buy, let's say, a bento, it comes in a plastic package and is immediately put in a plastic bag before you can say no. This is the company policy's fault. They are teaching their employees to pack them and wrap them when all you need is nothing, just the bento. It ends up in the garbage eventually so people can bring their bags and bring them home in that. The solution I came up for was that to change the material at the very least, to change it to something biodegradable or recyclable. It is such a simple task and yet adults cannot think about it and are only thinking about money. 
as is the usual case. In my opinion, education is a big part of all of this. People are not being taught about the issues in school, and that is the reason for this way of behaving. Teaching kids as young as possible about the reality and solutions is the only way that we can put an end to this. After all, our country's youths are the leaders for the next generation. And um, I was also hoping if I could introduce my older sister who goes to a different school in Japan and she will be talking about the difference in education between public schools and private schools here in Japan. Hi, I'm Monica's sister and I, uh, and I attend a public high school in Japan. If you compare public schools and private schools in Japan, you'll be surprised to hear that there are big differences in educational content. Unlike my sister's private school, that creates awareness of the SDGs, which stands for Sustainable Development Goals. As a goal for their entire school, the students in my school don't have the slightest ideas as to what the SDGs are. They were introduced to us through a social information class, but I felt that the teachers did it only because the prefecture exhorted them and the students were coerced into it. At my school, we were asked by the teachers to focus on the SDGs goals only for a field trip to Hokkaido. So, for example, if you wanted to achieve the 11th goal of rejuvenating the city, you could go to a museum that talks about what the city is best known for. This was the only time we focused on the SDGs rather than taking them account every day. Furthermore, I recently started wearing the SDGs pin at school. Unlike my sister's school that encourages students to wear them, I was the first one to do so. One day I was walking down the hallway and some students admired my pin, informing me that it was pretty instead of realizing that I was interested in the SDGs. It is disappointing because it proves just how little their enthusiasm towards improving the climate is. So I'll hand it over back to Annika. <laughs> okay. And so Japan is a world power and highly developed country that has a responsibility to lead the way in the fight against climate change. It is not fair that people in vulnerable countries get affected by global warming more than the people who are causing it, which is us. We live in a disposable age and everything we buy will end up in the trash and in worst cases, on the way, will harm more than it already does. We have started it now and we must end it. Thank you. Thank you, Annika, and thank you to your sister as well uh, for those really powerful insights. Eve, go ahead. I see your hand up there. Sorry, sorry. I, I was just, uh, I didn't mean to raise my hand. I just wanted to put the clapping, but it doesn't work when you. <laughs> that was very. Impressive. Yes, clapping indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm I'm happy to follow the lead on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Annika, just you speaking to the power of how uh, youth are mobilizing climate commu communication to the world uh, in such a unique way right now, and, and that is that is really just something to behold and 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 bear witness to. And then also the significance of access to reliable climate education content. Um, and so, really appreciate you bringing those um, issues and and kind of themes to the fore uh, in in your discussion there. So many thanks for that. Um, and we'll turn to our, um, our fourth panel uh, speaker today, last but certainly not least, um, Dr. Yolanda Lopez is an environmental uh, scientist specialist and a member and an expert on the Maya community focusing on integrative uh, science for sustainability. She has collaborated with uh, communitarian organizations in Mexico towards conservation and was a delegate for the UNPFII in 2017, providing expert and technical guidance for Indigenous peoples issues. Uh, so Dr. Lopez, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Megan. I hope you can hear me very well. Um, this has been a really interesting um, day, night today, depending on where you are based. 
um, about myself uh, before to start. I want to say that, um, yes, I hold a PhD from um, the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. I have been publishing my papers and I have been doing a lot of research around different aspects of the functioning of the natural earth. But most importantly, I want to mention that I'm a member of an indigenous community. So I want to bring here the perspective of indigenous peoples. So I want to start first with, a, with one of the questions, which is actually regarding the future. So essentially is what must be done to create a better and more just future for our planet? And the, in the question is the answer, because if we want to, to create a um, just future for our planet, so the main the object is going to be the planet, Mother Earth, nature. It's not human future. Of course, it's important human future, but if we put ourselves in a timeline of the age of the, our beautiful planet Earth and the, the, the age of human existence, we can see that we are just a minimum part. So having said that, it's important to consider that we all, the wider society, we, we really need to work together towards the future of our planet. It doesn't matter what uh, knowledge we have, if we are scientists or not, if we are children or if we are the youth. And one way to, to work together towards that future, toward that, that goal, is to understand how our planet functions, how our mother earth functions. And this is not, only a matter of scientists. This is a matter of all humans inhabiting Mother Earth, inhabiting planet, the planet. And maybe some of our uh, participants here are asking, okay, how can I know how the, the ecosystem works? But we have the fortune to live in an, in an era in which information is available everywhere. So we can Google how, what, what, the hydrological cycle is how it works, how we receive water, for example. So it's to, to understand how our, our nature functions is to understand that we as humans, we all have an impact, even minimum, to those processes of our, of our planet. And if we want to really, um, really uh, understand what the problem is, we need to first recognize that we are part of the problem. And we need to have this perspective that we, we are all interconnected. And this perspective has been here over millennia, um, essentially on, on those indigenous communities. We have been thinking that we are part of nature, that everything, all our actions are really uh, having an impact on, on the planet. So indigenous peoples, and being myself indigenous, I can say that, like, honestly, we have been a little bit romanticized in some way. We always talk about indigenous peoples, local communities, etc. But it's important to recognize that indigenous peoples have been here for over millennia, and we also possess methodologies tools, understanding, deep processes. We have been living together and along with nature for thousands of years, and we know how to understand it. And our understanding is not based on Western scientific approaches. It's a different epistemology, but it's a valid one because science has demonstrated that, so we receive COVID, for example. Science has demonstrated that we have climate change, we have COVID. And that science alone is probably not working in the best way. So we need to explore other sources of knowledge, not only indigenous knowledge, but also local knowledge, technical knowledge, et cetera. Why I'm saying this? Because indigenous peoples, they hold um, crucial environmental knowledge to protect our planet. And if the future is to protect the planet, a just future will be to consider all those, all, all this like valid and crucial information for, for humanity. And that could be the least information 
the remaining information that can help us to to achieve that uh, that vision. So I don't know if if um, this is a little bit um, confused, but I just want to to ask our participants to to do this uh, exercise to to see how long human existence has been in in the planet in in, in the Earth and how long the Earth has been. A, a living body, a living entity. So, continuing with with this uh, talk, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the environmental move, movement uh, around the world and and the ways moving forward. If ex specifically, I want to comment if the move if this environmental movement have particular blind spot, and I want to, to mention that. I have been in several uh, collaborating in different institutions and organizations from, from both the scientific and the policy uh, sphere. And um, I think the work and the efforts that some local and indigenous communities are, are, have been making for, for this environmental movement is not well, um, has not been well understood. Why? Because there are indigenous and local environmental defenders that are still being in danger. Indigenous communities are being in disadvantage in regards of decision-making processes, etc. And to 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 bring an example is um, I want to mention, for example, this little girl that I really admire a lot, Greta Thunberg. She one day she was kid. She decided, okay, I want to do something, and she. Uh, I don't remember if she stand up in front of a particular place, etc. But that night, she went back home safe. An indigenous environmental defender, if he or she do that, probably she won't be able to make it home. And that are the blind spot that it's important to to recognize and to and to support those environmental defenders fighting in the forefront. And how we can do that? Of course, we cannot go to, I don't know, to Indonesia, to Malaysia, to, to work together those environmental uh, protectors, environmental defenders. But what we can do is to reflect on our decisions, our daily life. So we know, for example, that um, there are less than five international corporations who are handle the global market of palm oil. I think there are only two, only two big international corporations handling all this marketing, all this market. So what we can do to support those environmental defenders, to read every day, to avoid uh, products containing palm oil, to be conscious in our um, activities, in our daily life, in our decisions. And with that, we can support and to make um, a little bit of noise to, to open those blind spots and to support those protecting the future of our planet. So my advice and my, my message today is, it's important to recognize that we indigenous peoples, we are, we want to work together. We want our knowledge to be recognized, but we have lost so much that we have lost our knowledge, our culture, our languages. So I'm myself Maya, so I cannot speak Maya. So it's important to start a process of recovery, recognizing and reestablish indigenous knowledge in order to work together towards a better planet. And I'm going to leave it uh, here. So maybe if there is any other question, I'm very happy to to answer and to discuss with the other participants. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just such powerful reflections. And um, I, I just want to highlight a couple of things that really caught my ear on that. One is um, it's not a human future. It's a planetary future that we're tied to um, and remembering that dynamic as well. Um, and then also this, you know, the conversation of merging and weaving knowledges, world knowledges and different knowledge perspectives together um, to address the most complex challenge that, that we face as a collective global community um, and drawing on the power of all of that knowledge together. Um, and then I also just wanna to touch on, you know, 
your really important point of access to safety to be a climate advocate or be a climate advocate uh, um, activist. Um, and, you know, tying back to uh, Dietmar, to, to your, you know, discussion on violence and, and the loss of culture as violence um, as well. And so, you know, tying all of that, that back together. Um, so thank you so much uh, for those, those insights and kind of setting a really wonderfully rich ground for us to kind of build further conversations on and explore some questions together. Um, so I'm going to move through a few questions here. Um, I do want to remind the audience that um, we've moved through some very, um, you know, rich and 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 powerful thoughts and reflections. So as we're moving through these questions, please add your questions to the chat. Um, audience members can also upvote uh, those questions as well, so that we can see them um, and and we can and explore some of those as well. But the first question that I want to uh, kind of turn to here is um, Annika and Eden, I'm going to kind of come to you first, and then I'm also going to open it up to, to everyone else as well. Um, but I want to explore kind of, you know, tonight we've talked about um, behavior and, you know, norm shifts and changes in different forms of climate action. And I want to just ask from your perspectives and experiences, you know, if you had to highlight one particular aspect or dynamic or that kind of thing, uh, what do you think needs to be done to create a better, more just future for our communities and planet? Um, and Annika, I'll come to you first. And I can put it in the chat so that you have that question in front of you as well. So I think what must be done to create a better and more just future for a planet is to really focus on education, to really teach young people, young young youth, to teach them from like elementary school and lower maybe. And it's really important to have that knowledge, the base knowledge in order to build up on top of that. Yeah, and Eden, if you want to build on top of that as well, um, yeah. Yeah, um, I think when we talk about a, a just future, we need to ground ourselves in the fact that we are already in an abhorrently unjust present. Um, so the work is really cut out for us when addressing climate change, we don't only have to prevent the worst, but actually it is an opportunity for us to create societies where more people can thrive in general. Um, so I think, yeah, just future means inequalities between every social group, whether that means class, race, gender, geographic location, um, those inequalities need to shrink across the board um, rather than widen as they consistently have um, even before um, we you know, knew climate change was a, was a crisis we had to deal with. And um, I think, um, yeah, Dr. Lopez said it really clearly, we need to change our, our relationship with the earth and also our relationships with each other. And um, that means you know, deconstructing big things like hegemony and our, our concepts of development trajectories, but it also means doing small things in our communities um, to, to move towards a, a more just future and uplifting um, marginalized people's voices. And um, I think it is a, something that needs to occur on both the macro and micro level um, in that way. But yeah, we definitely have our work cut out for us. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to see climate change as an opportunity to address that rather than something that makes that harder to do. But <laughs> yeah, and Dr. Lopez, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, Eden kind of referred to some of the comments you made. So I'll hand it over to you uh, to, if you'd like to respond to that question as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, as, as I said before, um, there are many, many ways to, um, to work towards a more justice, a more just uh, future. But um, it is important also to recognize that there are different definitions to, um, that might apply to, to this particular topic, which is if we are talking about inequalities, this is one thing, but if we are talking about inequity, that's another thing. 
if we are talking about fairness, that's another thing. So what we really want to focus on, because inequality can be rich versus poor, uh, south versus north, but inequities or inequity may, might uh, be a, around um, uh, environmental justice, for example, in which not everyone is um, well placed and, and not at the same level, for example. So there are many other inequities and inequalities that mu must be accounted for um, for creating this more just um, future for our planet. And when we consider all those different aspects, I think we can say, okay, we can we can make it. Otherwise, we will be suffering the same. Um, environmental challenges, we will be facing the same problems over and over until humanity, I'm not saying will disappear, but until humanity gets really uh, affected, I don't know, mentally. So just, just to give an example, there are many other planets around. We can send uh, people there, but please just be honest and, and try to answer this question. Is one of those planets as beautiful as our planet, as beautiful as, as our mother earth? We can build houses, we can build everything, but we cannot build those beautiful landscapes around us. The, the snow and, and the trees and the birds, everything is so perfect. And we really need to take care of that because we don't know if we will have that in other place. And it's, it's my, my message to your question. Thank you. Um, wonderful reflections and powerful connections to that as well. And uh, Detmer, I want to hand it over to you uh, if you would like to engage with that question as well. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I fully agree with what everyone has been saying so far. Um, and I would just want to add that I think one, what we really need to see now, I think, is a really a much more sincere engagement, actually listening to those communities that often have been invited in quite a performative way now in these spaces. I think there have been really incredible, powerful strides made by young people, by indigenous people, uh, forcing open the door of the space where they already should have been invited into. Um, but still, what I've often found in my experience in those spaces is that those voices are thanked for a speech, but they're not actually at the negotiation table, not actually making those changes that are so crucial and needed. So I think one, there needs to be a reckoning about which voices are actually listened to um, and guide our action. Um, and then I had a second point, but it's a bit late um, in the night for me. So I forgot that second point, so I'm so sorry, but I will make that second point. Also, we should just keep oil, oil in the ground. Um, I think that, that was where my second point was. Um, I think, the second point is that we know we can mobilize the action that is needed in response to COVID-19. We saw the incredible mobilization of funds and change and things like that that, are, that were indeed necessary, but those were also the things we were told and have been told for decades weren't possible in response to climate change. So now that the veil has lifted in a way, um, I think it's also that reckoning of listening to voices and actually implementing what they're saying and putting our money where our mouth is, which now we know we can do. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, great point there. Um, always a good second point to say, just keep oil on the ground. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, uh, I think, so that kind of leads into, you know, so the second question I want to explore then um, with everybody, I'll open this up to, to everybody um, and just kind of jump in as you see moved by the question. Um, what do you see as the most important mindset then that we need to engage in the immediate future? So thinking about, again, how are we connecting with communities and what is the, what is the immediate mindset that we need um, for communicating or engaging or mobilizing? I can maybe jump in just off the top of my head. I think of compassion um, and that means, you know, for each other, for the earth, for communities that are directly affected on the front lines. And I think that that, you know, it's really important to approach this situation with compassion for everyone involved in the situation. 
I can only really speak to the, the Canadian context that I'm familiar with, but there is a lot of polarization between people who have hard lives, um, who are working class, who you know aren't the CEOs and billionaires who have lied to people about this crisis. Um, and you, just depending on where you, you grow up in Canada, what community you're in, you're going to be on, on different sides of this very politicized debate. And I think to bridge that, we really need to have compassion for each other. People are affected by climate change in a variety of different ways, whether that means you're an oil and gas worker or whether that means, you know, you live in a city or, or whether that means that you're Indigenous and your lands are, are being invaded. You know, we're all infected, affected by this crisis. Um, and there's a lot of animosity. And I think, yeah, if we could just approach this um, with a lot of compassion and solidarity, um, that's, that's the mindset that that I would love to see more of. Yeah, and I'll open that up to other panelists as well, if there's anything that comes to mind. Um, yeah, for me, um, and it might be a little cheeky working for a prevention organization, but I think that preventative mindset, I think is so important. We think about um, the, the world we wanna live in, a just world, an inclusive world, a safe world, and so much, I think, of that if we shift thinking about prevention, and it's not just about prevention of violence, but also when we think about climate change, um, there's this really powerful cartoon, um, I think it illustrates of like, oh, even if climate change was a hoax, okay, so we got, you know, renewable energy, we got cleaner air, we got biodiversity, we got greener spaces, we got connections with nature, we got human rights, like, even if it was a hoax, all those things are wonderful too. Um, so I think it is a preventative mindset of, of thinking of, how do we actually build that 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 better world, and, and how can we how can we achieve that? And I think crucial in that is what Eden was saying earlier of climate change being that symptom of that unjust world. Um, and I think that really needs to shift in our mindset too. Yvonne or Annika, um, if you, if if nothing comes to mind, that's okay. We can move on to an, to another question as well. I just want to make sure everyone has a chance to engage. If you and if if I happen to move on and you do want to engage, you can just throw your hand up or jump in as well. I don't really have much to add. I feel like the points they made were Eden and Detmer made were really good. So. Yeah, and I wonderful. And um, I can move on. We've got some audience questions coming in, and I think um, we can turn to some of these audience questions to explore them. Um, can all the panelists see the audience questions? Okay, good. Just want to make sure that you have access to read those as well. Um, so just starting at the uh, with that top question, uh, what might a just transition for workers in the Canadian oil sector look like? Or again, you know, my resource workers maybe um, also beyond Canada, but for this particular question, uh, what might a just transition for workers in the Canadian oil sector look like when those jobs disappear? What is next for those communities? So anybody want to, to touch on that one to start off? I can maybe speak a little bit to this one. Um, I really wish that there was a, a sector that everyone could just move to that was clean and green and exciting and that everyone's skills perfectly aligned with. It's really unfortunate though, you know, our economy is so disproportionately um, dependent on the oil and gas industry that it will be a really hard thing to break up with. And that's why we need the just transition. Um, what oil and gas workers have said that that should look like um, is different for every community, but generally providing uh, train, retraining programs for people to enter jobs that, um, you know, interest them um, without a decrease in pay. So that, you know, can't just be done through the private sector. The government will have to put significant amounts of money into a, a program um, like that to, to guarantee that people still are able to put food on the table um, and also have meaningful work and work that they feel fulfilled by um, and excited about. Um, yeah, I wish there was there was one one type of sector. Um, obviously, there will be more, um, you know, options for other um, energy projects and renewables, um, but that won't necessarily replace those um, that same industry with the same skill sets. So there'll be like a significant period where the government will, will have to support people through that that transition. 
I am um, when I was at COP there was um, a union rep from um, it was an oil and gas union in Quebec and he had a really interesting analogy um, he was saying imagine you know you're in a forest and it's on fire and you have your family and your house and your entire community on your back and you're running and then there's a stream in front of you um, you know if someone built a bridge over that stream so you could get to the other side you would take that bridge we're just waiting for the government to you know provide the means for that 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 bridge to exist we're waiting for um, these programs to help people through that because you know it is a, a really tough situation um, that these communities face Great, thank you for those reflections. Uh, if anyone else wants to jump in on that question, feel free. We're gonna move on to the next question here. And again, if, if, if somebody kind of has a reflection they wanna bring back to the table, by all means, please uh, jump in. Um, but I wanna to move to uh, the second question here at the bottom of um, uh, the this, this second post here. Uh, what do you think can be done to combat or balance the growing prevalence of corporate environmentalism? So thinking about the corporate uh, dynamic of environmentalism. Um, and Annika, you were kind of speaking about, um, you know, going upstream to where those plastics are being produced, for example. So thinking about how are corporate, um, you know, how are corporations using this environmental greenwashing, so to say, or something like that, so that they can still produce these plastics or produce excess waste and that kind of thing. So um, just wondering what your reflections are on that maybe. Um, so I didn't really understand what the question was. Uh, so the question that was being posed is, what do you think can be done to combat or balance the growing prevalence of corporate environmentalism? So some of the big corporations who are, you know, saying that they're being green or some of the big corporations that are saying that they're now keen environmentalists. Um, does that resonate with you that you think the corporations are, are coming to their environmentalism honestly, or do you think that they're using this as kind of a, a shield to allow them to continue with the status quo, for example? Um, I think they are. I think they are using to shield themselves. Using to shield themselves because they don't want to show. Because they don't want to show the reality of what's actually happening. Mm hmm. I'm sorry, I don't. No, I don't. that's okay. No, and I think you already spoke to that. I think you spoke to that very well when you gave your presentation about, uh, you know, how you were reflecting on plastics and how you re were reflecting on the sources of that and how we know what those solutions are. So I, th I think you spoke to that very well um, in, in your presentation. Uh, so that's kind of why I threw it to you because I felt like you you covered that very well. Um, but I'll also open that up to uh, to anyone else if anyone else has any reflections on you know prevalence of corporate environmentalism and and where they're taking that or how we might want to reflect on that. Um, go ahead. Maybe, yeah, thank you. Maybe um, I can add something here that. Uh, is related but it's not related so when i'm when i uh, start um, this conversation um, i i mentioned the importance to understand how the world functions and this is because um, we also need to know how our our uh, activities uh, bring some impact to to our environment and is where uh, the information of these environmental corporations are not, um, I mean, those corporations are not giving us the, the total and, and the real information. And it's important to inform ourselves how their products, their processes are bringing also impacts to, to the natural world. So for example, we we know, we, we learn a lot about this, uh, matter is neither not created, not destroyed, only changes. So in terms of plastics, it's important to understand that we can reuse, we can recycle, we can move through this 
circular economy and and reduce everything. But as soon as something is created, it will never get destroyed. It will exist for thousands of years. So it's important to consider that before using or recycling or everything is just not not buying. Of course, there are a lot of selfish interests, but we can, as I said before, we can uh, bring our um, little amount of, uh, I, I don't know the, the, the precise word, but we, we can do something individually to act collectively. And that my, uh, were you uh, wanting to weigh in on that as well? Um, yeah, just very, very briefly, um, I was struck by the question. And um, I think one of the tricky parts also of being an activist is, is a perennial conversation. I don't know if I can call myself an activist. I think it's always a weird thing to call yourself. But it's the perennial tug of war. Do I go against the system or do I try to change something in it? And I think that's always... And people fall on different sides on that, on different topics at different points in their life. And, and when I saw that question, I was really struck by um, thinking about what Eden was saying about Article 6 and these, these market-based mechanisms. And I'm really struck by the incredible work organizations like the Center for International Environmental Law are doing, which, and, and I might, if I misrepresent it, I apologize, um, you know, are not in favor of Article 6. But Article 6 is now a part of the Paris rule book. It is there. So how can we make sure that if it is there, there's rights-based approaches to it. There's independent grievance mechanisms for it. There's um, preferably free, uh, free prior and informed consent, or at least consultation. Um, and, and it's not that any of these things will make a market-based mechanism go away. But if it can mitigate some of that damage, I'm using the word mitigate as a climate word here very intentionally. Um, that is also something we're fighting for. And I think we, that's like maybe also what I mean with the horizontal challenge. You need all those things everywhere. Um, and so I think that's that's also a really difficult reality. How do you balance it corporate environmentalism? As part of it is that at least you try to put some, some protections on it. Um, yeah, any other follow-ups on that? Yeah, maybe I'll just... Um, jump in with some, some final words. I totally agree with what um, my co-panelists have said so far. And yeah, we there needs to be more um, regulation of, of the private sector, especially um, internationally um, in relation to Article 6 as well. Um, but yeah, I think also just um, we need to remember to, to view corporate actions critically and we need to um, yeah, have a healthy degree of skepticism when we see these announcements or when we see, you know, this this green product or this and think, how is this being marketed towards me? How, how does this actually benefit this company? Did they sell more, you know, of X product because of this type of marketing? Um, and I think just, yeah, being a, a critical consumer is really important. And it's also really important to think about um, the, the media that we consume and the way that um, the environmentalist movement is being portrayed by these large media conglomerates, newspapers that are owned and um, websites that are owned by, you know, a couple big um, companies are going to be filtering the news about the environmental movement um, and shaping it a certain way. And so I think also like reading a lot of um, independent sources, independent newspapers um, also helps, you know, provide some healthy um, criticism of this um, more corporate um, environmentalist movement. Um, yeah, I think having some skepticism is, is good and doing your research. <laughs> and uh, even those points remind me of, Annika, what you spoke to in your presentation, which was um, having a, a critical engagement with the knowledge, right? You kind of talked about one, once you learned a little bit, you were like, I want to know more. And you were kind of talking about how you critically go into that information to seek out what is actually happening um, and having that critical lens that you bring to that. Um, and so I think that's a really nice uh, tie together there, um, Annika, from your presentation to, to think about this particular issue at hand. Um, and so I just want to move on to um, our, 
our next question here, there's a few in the chat, so I just want to see what we can get through before uh, we have to move on, just being conscious of time. Um, so one of the questions in the, in the Q&A um, thread, so as Eden mentioned, how the neoliberal political economic system we currently have has failed us regarding climate change. So I'm wondering what sort of different political economic system we could transition to in order to genuinely genuinely deal with the climate crisis. Um, and Dr. Lopez, I actually want to kind of start with you on this particular question, um, just because of some of the conversation you brought forth um, in talking about knowledge and talking about shared uh, worldviews um, and knowledge systems and epistemologies. Um, so are there any reflections on that question you'd like to bring forward? Yes, thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, I can um, bring the perspective uh, in, in this moment, not my indigenous pers perspective, but as a system thinker. So I'm always thinking about systems. And we as a society, we're always saying, okay, the current uh, government uh, and the political system is not working in the best way and we are suffering and climate change, etc." But we never see ourselves as a part and as a crucial subsystem of that particular political system. So if we if we analyze this, the problems humanity is facing, or yeah, let, let's put it in that way. So we have we are subsystems of bigger systems. And when I'm saying this, is because again, my my point all the time is that we really need to analyze our individual um, actions our, as individuals, and then we can start thinking about everything else. If we don't read at least, for example, what we are consuming, where it comes from, what is the food we are, if we are not uh, thinking about the resilience of our food systems that are dominated by um, products that are uh, commercialized, uh, for example, globally, without respecting uh, traditional food systems, etc. So all these things matter, but all are part of individual decisions. And after we change, we can ask for changing on the global political system. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, thank you for starting us off on that um, question. And uh, would any of the other panelists like to weigh in on that uh, question as well with some reflections? Yeah, sure, I can add some thoughts. Um, I love this question. This is what is exciting about addressing climate change to me is we get to be creative in our solutions and the way that we um, address these problems and potentially address the other inequalities that I mentioned in our presentation that have existed and can continue to exist too. Um, so it is actually an opportunity to restructure. Um, and I think what Dr. Lopez was saying is, is so true. I think this, um, you know, the, the way that we restructure our societies will look different in every place as it should. Um, that's a part of what self-determination means. That's a part of what um, autonomy and sovereignty means for different groups around the world as they get to define that, that process. It's not defined by markets. Um, and I think, you know, speaking of Canada, I think what it would look like is a um, re-extension of the, the welfare state um, you know, removing or adding um, greater support to, to people, especially lower income people, working class people in our society. Um, people have probably heard discussions of Just Transition Bill, Green New Deal. Um, there are so many opportunities for us to um, address systemic inequalities um, through addressing climate change. And um, yeah, I think, I think it's an exciting time. We will see a lot greater, more programs and more support um, for, for people in different societies. But again, that will look different um, no matter where you are in the world as it, as it should. It shouldn't be directed top down. It should, be, should come from um, what communities need and what um, different situations demand, but yeah. Yeah, it's a good reminder of there's no one size fits all. There's no universal uh, solution, right? Yeah, wonderful. Um, I just want to give the other panelists a chance to, to touch on that question if anything comes to mind. And if not, I'll move on to the next question. Okay. 
Um, and so um, there's a question here, which I, I, I really appreciate, and it has to do with hope. Um, and all of you in your conversations and, and kind of discussions today talked about providing optimism and not trying to just doom and gloom everybody, but um, have some solutions-based thinking and have some, um, you know, ways to connect people with, with actions um, as opposed to just that paralyzing anxiety. Um, so how would you recommend for a person in their everyday life to strike a balance between um, conscious uh, environmentalism and hopefulness, especially for those in their 20s or, or the youth um, who are seeing some of these big challenges before them? So anything come to mind for the panelists there? And Annika, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but Annika, I will ask, is there anything that comes to mind for you when you think about um, offering messages of hope uh, to youth and, and to those organizers who are addressing environmentalism? So are we talking about leaders of the country? Uh, more about every people in their everyday lives. So people who oh. are kind of navigating these issues and any messaging you might have for them on how to strike a balance between being conscious of how to be an environmentalist and, and, and engage in those, but also maintaining a sense of hope at the same time. I feel like they're very different things. So it's really hard to balance those two at the same time. I do feel like so um i actually do want to know how to balance so if somebody could tell me yeah we're um, all looking for that same solution aren't we <laughs> <laughs> i think that's one of the struggles everybody has right now is, is finding those those moments of hope um, amid you know some of the 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 heavier climate feelings that we might be navigating uh does anyone else want to explore that question Maybe I can talk a little bit about the hope. So for me, like being a scientist and reading every day all this current environmental situation and all the fragility of our planet, at some points we, we feel hopeless um, reading all these things and we are being every day, the news, etc. But I think I found hope on the beauty of nature. Every day, every day I wake up, I, it doesn't matter where I am, it doesn't matter from which place I came from, what language it is, I, it doesn't matter anything, just really I'm focusing on working for having a better planet, for living a better planet, or for living at least a planet in the same way I, I receive it, at least. And I think my, my advice to, to the and the new generations is that um, it's never too late to start and how we can start by really focusing on what we have in our surrounding environment because we every day we go into social media and we see things that are not true and they really influence our ways of living our ways of um buying things and deciding for things but let's stay local to and think global for for a better you know for a for prosperity for for feeling better every day yeah that's wonderful thank you for that um do any uh anybody else want to weigh in on that that hope thread Um, yeah, um, I think that's such an important question. Um, I mean, I work at an organization where I think about climate change, but a lot of our work also focuses on mass violence, such as genocide. So hope is is so important um, and, and so cherished. And I absolutely love what Dr. Lopez was saying about how can you find it where you are? Um, sometimes it can feel like the, the choices we make are very small, right? Like it, it can... The, the, the choices we make to, for example, use less plastic, sometimes feel like they're so small in the grand scale of things when Shell and BP and ExxonMobil are still doing all of their things. And so sometimes for me, it help, really helps in, 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 in 
trying to understand what those impacts are. Because if I, for example, use less plastic here, like yes, my individual choice is not going to stop the plastic island in the ocean from happening, but it will stop the birds where I live eating those things. It will help the biodiversity right where I live. So I think sometimes when you think about a personal actions, I think that environmental consciousness and hope can actually become one because we do have that impact right where we are. And I think it's the same with the human relationships we hold, the grace we offer to others. Um, when, you know, even like I used to, I've worked quite a lot in, in, the, in the food service industry. And sometimes you have a really rough day and your waiter is rude to you. And it's not because that waiter is a rude person. It's because they have a really, really difficult job and it's a long day. And so offering grace to someone can mean so much. So I think thinking about those small things and the immediate impacts around you, not because they will solve everything, but because there is a real impact. And I think we, I think we deserve to see that impact um, and, and celebrate it. Thank you for that. I think that's a great reminder as well. Um, Eden, I'm conscious of time and I just want to do some, some wrapping up, but I do want to give you, you know, 30 seconds to a minute to maybe just reflect on that as well quickly uh, before we close out. Because I think it's a powerful um, ending to end on hope. Yeah, absolutely. And an important place to end it too. Um, maybe I'll, I'll give a little bit of context that I learned while I was at COP that, that felt hopeful to me. Um, so while I was there, you know, it was my first conference of the parties, first time being there, and I was very overwhelmed and felt very discouraged. And then um, I met up with um, a group of people who have been going to COPS for the last, I don't know, 20 years, environmental activists, and they all had such hope and they were so excited because they've been going to these meetings for decades and they are able to see the progress that me as a young activist have only, you know, seen the couple years I've been involved. And they have seen climate change go from something that nobody knew about, um, that there was, you know, rampant disinformation being spread about, um, and no one was acting on it, to it is like now the, one of the top issues that leaders are thinking about in a couple decades. And yes, that process is not happening fast enough. And yes, there I still have such deep cynicism for that process and for a lot of the actors involved, but we are moving in the right direction and the science is clear and you could hear that in in the way that even the world leaders were speaking they they understand and we are addressing the problem and that is you know that has improved drastically in the last couple decades and um, we are seeing win after win after win um, whether that's in courts you know shell was just found to be accountable for um uh yeah their activities um we're seeing wins as far as um uh, courts for indigenous groups um, protecting their lands. Um, we're seeing the implementation of UNDRIP in multiple different scenarios. Um, we're slowly beginning to see um, a move towards climate justice and a move towards addressing climate change. And um, yeah, we can we can debate the speed of which that needs to happen, but you know, it is happening. Um, this is the first COP where the words fossil fuels were mentioned in the final agreement, which is actually a huge victory. Before that, we were never even able to, to get everyone to agree to put a name. We're seeing the phase down of, of coal power plants, which is huge. That's very exciting. We're seeing the phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. So, you know, there are qualifiers, but there is still a move in the right direction. Um, and I think that that's really important to put things into perspective, especially as young people just entering this scene right now, it seems bleak, but we're, it, it's moving in the right direction and that's exciting, so. Yeah, I think it was really lovely that we ended up on, so, so to the audience member who posed a question about hope, thank you for that. Uh, it was a great way to wrap up this conversation, this very complex conversation. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, so I just wanna move to some closing remarks uh, I want to thank the audience for uh, sharing your time and attention with us today. Um, time is precious. Uh, we're in a, a intersecting crises, and so we really do value, value your showing up today and spending some time to explore these uh, themes and issues. Uh, thank you to our wonderful uh, panelist speakers today for your thoughtful insights and answers uh, and reflections and time to, to move through these issues and themes with us. Um, so powerful. Um, and I, I really know that folks who will come back to reflect on this um, will be much enriched by being able to, to watch these conversations later on. 
Uh, I'd like to thank the Kanokai Chair, um, the Center for Japanese Research at UBC, the International Relations Students Association, and the UBC Climate Hub uh, for putting this together. I wish everyone found that, I hope everyone found this event uh, to be an insightful look at the current state of youth in climate activism around the world uh, and what some of the challenges and issues are that um, we're facing when it comes to hope and opportunity uh, and, and changing for climate policies. This marks the end of the three-part event series of climate change negotiating at the brink. How does the world solve the climate crisis? Hosted by the UBC Konwakai Chair. Uh, for those who are interested in events like this and the topics we address today, please wel um, we welcome you to attend our event next Thursday called Hope for the Future of Youth in Asia. This event will take place on Zoom at 5 p.m and will feature a panel of activists and scholars addressing education, participation of youth in social justice movements and politics. Um, and the video recordings of these events will be uploaded um, maybe about a week, week and a half uh, to the Center for Japanese Research website, which the link um, will be posted. Uh, so please watch the videos again, share because there was such a rich discussion here um, that I think can just be shared, uh, shared with so many um, in so many different ways. Uh, I'd also like to hand it back over to uh, Jackie to do a bit of an event shout out that is coming up that would be a really cool event to engage with. Jackie, over to you. Thank you, Megan. And once again, I just wanted to thank everybody um, for participating in this panel. I know that I learned a lot um, from all of your contributions and I think your conversation was very insightful. So once again, thank you for um, participating in this event. But I just wanted to give a really quick shout out to all of the UBC students and the Vancouver community who's attending right now because URSA is organizing the um, 16th annual Spring Benefit Gala, which will be happening on Sunday, March 27th from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the UBC AMS Great Hall. So please join us for a masquerade theme night with amazing music and food food featuring live music and a silent auction with over $1,500 in prices. And you can bid on experiences ranging from personal training to luxury um, restaurant visits. And the gala will feature a fully catered three course banquet style buffet featuring a bar and liquid nitrogen ice cream <laughs> in case you're interested in that. And all of our profits, 100% of our profits will be donated to the Downtown Eastside Women's Center. So if you're interested, please check out Ursa's event page for more information and also discount codes. Thank you again and go ahead, Megan. Thank you for that. That sounds really uh, like a lovely event. Um, so again, thank you uh, to the audience today. Thank you to the panelists today. Um, um, Dr. Lopez put in the chat a link to one of their initiatives. So please check out that website and connect with that website as well. Um, and uh, thank you again to UBC, uh, CJR and Common Kai IRSA. Um, I wish everyone uh, a restful day or night wherever you are. Uh, Dr. Lopez, I, I do know it's in the middle of the night for you right now. So we wish you uh, a restful sleep <laughs> into, into your following morning. Uh, and thank you everyone from wherever you are joining today. Again, uh, sharing this space with you is, is a joy and a privilege. So have a great uh, onward adventure. <laughs>